Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for, with such sacrifices. God is pleased. The subject this morning is how to praise God effectively. Uh, there's a tremendous advantage in being asked to speak on a subject that you not really looked at before and are not familiar with. This means for a start you have to seek the Lord and you have to find out uh, what he is saying about it and then to look at his word and I began to realize uh, after a while uh, that um, it was all over scripture uh, the, the praise and worship of our God and what an important part that it plays. To teach first of all a person has to learn um, and we may think that we know uh, how to do something uh, and then we find we come to explain it to somebody else and then we realize that it has to be put forward it put across in a different way so that everybody can understand and certainly as far as this subject is concerned about effective praise and worship i've found that a lot of new things have come to light jesus said once when he was talking to a woman who'd had a very dubious background uh, when it began to get a bit too near the source of all her problems uh, Jesus, uh, the, the woman turned to Jesus and said, started talking about worship. And Jesus said, the time is coming when you, it's not a matter of where you worship the Father, it's that you will need to worship him and in spirit and in truth. And Jesus also said in another place, he said, without me, you can do nothing. That means absolutely nothing, including praising and worshiping him. True praise and worship has to find its source in heaven. And then it comes to us and then it gets returned to the place where it came from. Uh, some people, a well-known organisation, uh, trying to help uh, Christians in persecuted countries and doing a great work. They made a film of Richard Wormbrand's book, Torture for Christ. It can't have been an easy um, film uh, to make and it wasn't an easy film to watch either. But it showed in there that there were, there were prisoners there and they were using their chains as percussion instruments in order to encourage themselves in worship. So it's not a matter of going out and spending a lot of money on the most expensive sound equipment, microphones, leads and cables and lots of flashing lights. Uh, the world can do that much better than we can. It's a matter of being in tune uh, with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ and then offering back to him uh, what he has given us. One of the things that really uh, struck me uh, was this uh, verse in uh, Hebrews chapter 13 there about um, continually offering to God a sacrifice of praise. Praise and worship is not something that we turn on for an hour on a Sunday and then turn it off again. It's something that we need to be in an attitude of mind. Uh, it says here we're to do it continually. And then it says uh, that we're to offer a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And what this speaks to me of is this praise and worship should actually be our native language. Doesn't matter whether it's on a Sunday or during the week or in the night or any time. It should be a language that we, that we speak in the same way that we speak English or possibly some other language as well. But praise and worship of our God should be our native language uh, as we come before him. Psalm 92 says, it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. If we just look for a moment at uh, Romans 12. And uh, if you just look there, Paul has just been, uh, Paul has just been um, speaking about God's dealings with the Jews and the Gentiles in chapter 11. And he then goes into um, a, a prayer uh, of uh, absolutely spontaneous thanksgiving uh, and worship to, to the Lord. And then in chapter 12, he comes back on it again. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, because this is your spiritual act of worship. It isn't just a matter uh, of, uh, of offering that which is easy to us. Sometimes it's sacrificial. Sometimes we have to make time. 
uh, it's sending that card, making that phone call, making that visit. And so we have to offer to him sacrifices. And these things are pleasing to God. If it's not convenient to us, it is pleasing to him. The prayers of the new convert can be very refreshing, can't they? I don't know if you remember when your children first learned to speak. Uh, it was amusing. It was interesting to see what they were thinking. Uh, and I certainly used to listen to ours, uh, intrigued to think how their minds were working. The new convert is like a child of God, it's not familiar with the language that we're familiar with. Therefore, it's often very refreshing. And the enemy doesn't like us uh, uh, to, to praise and worship our God. He doesn't like it happening. He wants to stop us. A man I got quite close to a very long time ago, uh, his name was Don. He was driving his car one day. And uh, as he was driving along, he was singing for all he was worth. He is Lord, he is Lord. He has risen from the dead as he is Lord. And a stone flicked up off the roadway smashed into his windscreen and shattered it into thousands of little pieces. And he drove off to get it repaired and he went into uh, a, a place where they repair windscreens and he said, do you know what he said? I was going along, he said, and I was singing this song, he is Lord, he is Lord, he has risen from the dead and he is Lord and a stone came up off the road and smashed my windscreen as though the enemy was saying I don't want any more of that. He said the man thought I was completely mad, but I shared it with him just the same. The enemy uh, demonstrated his displeasure when Jesus rode into, rose into Jerusalem. The authorities afraid that their position was being undermined and that, they, uh, that it, things were getting out of their control. Uh, they complained about his, um, what he was doing. They complained about the people singing at the tops of their voices, Hosanna, to the, Hosanna in the highest. And they said, tell, you, uh, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, if I do that, he said, the stones will cry out. Their routine and their authority was being challenged. And then there was the children singing in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Do you hear what these children are saying, they said? And they didn't tell them to be quiet, but Jesus gave a very interesting answer. He quoted from one of the Psalms and he said, from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Now children are not political in any way. And what Jesus didn't quote, but which they would have known, was the next part. Which says, out of the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise to silence the foe and the avenger. In that precise moment, the foe and the avenger were the people who are trying to silence the children. And because of their praise and worship, they couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't say to the children, you really must be quiet. Take your Sunday school somewhere else. Don't let them carry on like that. And so it was irrefutable, the children saying that Jesus was the son of David. In other words, he was the Messiah. So true praise and worship can actually make people rather cross. When we look at the book of Job, we see that after all the uh, terrible time that Job had, and that's a subject in itself, Job, a man who uh, is described as, um, as being so righteous and upright, and a man who came before God, and the Lord looked down at him and he said, who is this that obscures my counsel without any knowledge? Who's down there bringing this cloud across my judgment and across my, uh, across my reasoning? And Job had to admit that he didn't really know very much. He thought he knew quite a lot. He thought he lived a life that was close to God. It says that when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord turned his captivity. Uh, Job was a man uh, who, who thought he was pretty good, but God showed him where his weaknesses was, were. And then when he turned to the Lord and he said, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Our attitude as we come before a holy God has to be one of repentance and realizing who we really are in Jesus Christ.
and what he has done for us and how great mercy is shown for us, just like it says in Romans 12 there, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy. And God's mercy is so great and so loving. The story that I actually find really very challenging is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I wonder if you just have a look at that uh, uh, with me for a moment. Uh, Chronicles is not difficult to find. Uh, King Jehoshaphat was threatened. He was threatened by some co cousins of his, uh, distant cousins from a long time ago. Um, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and uh, some people who effectively were children of Esau. And they uh, were threatening his kingdom. The kingdom had been divided into Judah and Israel, Judah in the south, Israel in the north. And it appears, looking at that, to my mind, that the attack was uh, unprovoked. It may have been for political reasons. There's bound to be a reason for it somewhere. Uh, but uh, people came and they warned him. They said, there's a vast army uh, coming against you. Uh, there is nothing like a, a message is that stir us up that um, somebody says, look out, so-and-so is happening, or if you don't do so-and-so, this will happening. I very much fear that in the last, uh, just over a year now, uh, in this pandemic, there has been a huge amount of scaremongering. Uh, some of it has not been very level-headed at all. We need to look at the facts and take care. A vast army is coming against you from... Edom was the direction they were coming from. Um, and so everybody, Joseph Jehoshaphat and all the people were alarmed. And I wanted to notice how he, how he handled this. For a start, he resolved to inquire of the Lord. Uh, sometimes like Jesus, we have to set our face like flints. We have to resolve. There may be temptation in the way. We have to resolve that we're going to overcome it. We have to resolve in a giving situation when there is alarm and despondency. We have to resolve. We're going to inquire of the Lord about this. And so he proclaimed a fast and he got all the people together and they all came. And then he stood up in the assembly of the people. And he, and he, and he, uh, he gave this prayer. There are just shadows, I won't look at the prayer in detail, but there are just shades in there of uh, something of the Lord's Prayer, acknowledging God's sovereignty, our Father in heaven. Uh, and uh, then he, um, I want us also to notice that right at the end of that prayer there, he says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you, our eyes are upon you. What a wonderful position to be in, in facing that terrible danger of being attacked by overwhelming forces. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. The whole family is involved. They're all standing there with wives, children, and little ones before the Lord. And then the spirit of the Lord came upon one of them. They were listening for what God was saying. And uh, it came through this man, Jehaziel. And so they went out against those, those people. And the message there was uh, that they wouldn't have to fight the battle. The battle was the Lord and the Lord was going to be with them. They were acting on the instructions of this word that had come. And so Jehoshaphat instructed people, he put the worship group in the front of the army to go out and they sang this song. They sang, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of the story. The fact of the matter was that those enemies all turned on each other and they destroyed themselves. But I want us also to notice as they went back to the temple, they were still praising and worshipping God. How often do we forget to do that? Something happens, God does something amazing in our lives, and we go off and forget what it was that was troubling us in the first place. True effective praise and worship is bound to have its effect. It will have its effect and it will bring out the best in people and it will also bring out uh, the worst. So you just looked in Acts chapter 4 just now, just to finish our thoughts this morning. 
Let's look at this. We've got Peter and John, two people, as we've discussed before, with no education at all. Uh, going into the temple one day, there's a lame man there. He's never walked. I was in hospital when I was 11 for a month. I couldn't walk uh, after a month uh, of lying in bed. And uh, I found out it was like, what it was like to have to start walking all over, all over again. The man is asking for money and Peter and John say, we haven't got any. Uh, but he said, what we have, we will give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he got up and he walked and he leaped. That is physically impossible of our own doing. In God's sovereignty and in his power, the work of a creator God worked in his feet and ankle bones. They received strength and he went into the temple. He wasn't just walking, he was leaping, he was praising God. He was absolutely thrilled with what had happened. And so was everybody else. That was the thing. And once again, the authorities were unhappy about what was happening. Uh, authorities very often, they can be controlling people and these were controlling people. This was outside of their control. Uh, and they didn't like it for that reason. Uh, they didn't want people walking and leaping and praising God and giving thanks to him uh, without their say-so. Sometimes we can be a bit like that in the church. Something takes off spontaneously and immediately somebody wants to bring it under the control of the authority of the church. We need to ask God to protect us from thinking like that and need to recognize when God is working, when the Holy Spirit is moving in the church so that we move, we move with him and don't hinder him. So the one thing they're trying, they call, they arrest Peter and John uh, and they, they take them into custody. The very people who should have known, the temple guard, they should have known what it was all about. They were there when Jesus rose from the dead. They were the ones guarding the tomb. So they should have known. Uh, and uh, they arrest them and they're questioning them and they're trying to work it all out. And Peter explains to them about the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. They're all astonished. The other thing they can't work out is how it is that Peter and John come to have this knowledge uh, and this, this learning when they haven't, they're unschooled, they're ignorant. And they says that they took knowledge of them, they had been uh, with Jesus. Anyway, they couldn't think what to do about it. They couldn't think how to punish them. I don't see why they should be punished. They've done something quite extraordinary in the name of Jesus. Why that deserves punishment is sort of one of the perversities of human nature. So eventually they made some threats against them and they said, you're to stop it. You're not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they said, well, you can tell us to stop it, but actually we're so full of it, we can't help it. Well, that's something to aim for, isn't it? So full of it, we can't help speaking about the Lord Jesus. And so they went back uh, to they went back to their uh, to their meeting place, and they saw the others. I want us to see uh, just how this goes here. Okay, if you look, uh, if you've got your Bible open, and you're looking in Acts chapter four and verse twenty-three, there uh, they prayed. Okay, they prayed. First of all, they acknowledged the sovereignty of God. I'm looking at verse 24. Then they acknowledged him as the creator, a subject that's very dear to my heart and most of yours, I know. I think it's so wonderful that God is the creator. And then they referred to Old Testament scripture, what David had said about the people, the nations raging, and the people plotting in vain, and the kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And then they bring it into their own situation. They said, in view of all this, Lord, will you consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with boldness? We've been told to be quiet. We don't want to do that. We want to shout it even louder. And they prayed. And it says the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Well, that's something absolutely wonderful, isn't it? To know that uh, that God should shake that place where they were meeting by the power of his Holy Spirit because of all that was going on at that time. I was going to say maybe we ought to check the building's insurance for places where we meet. Uh, who knows what God may do? Maybe we all need to be shaken. I have been very challenged about this 
uh, issue of praising God and worshipping effectively. I trust that in the thoughts that we've shared together this morning that you'll be encouraged to do exactly that and that prayer and praise will become yours and my native language. Amen.